This is Jay Krishnamurti's second seminar with scientists at Brockwood Park, 1974. Well, I'm... Um I'm a physicist. My field is uh, theoretical high energy physics, which is also called particle physics because it investigates the subatomic particles. Uh, I think my interest in this conference will be obvious from what I'm going to say. Uh, I want to talk about two kinds of knowledge which come from two different, very different sources and which seem totally unrelated to most people, but which in fact appear to be related in a very close and significant way. I'm talking here about scientific knowledge on the one hand, and when I say scientific knowledge I'm referring mainly to physics because this is my personal experience of science. On the other hand, I'm talking about what I call uh, for simplicity, mystical knowledge, that is, the knowledge that has been developed by mystics of all ages and traditions. I've spent several years exploring the parallels between the worldview emerging from modern physics and the worldview of Eastern mysticism. And I found that these parallels are striking, uh, significant and profound. Of course, I shall not have time here to go into the parallels in great detail, uh, but I have brought an article which uh, sums up a book I'm just completing about the parallels between modern physics and Eastern philosophy. And people who are interested in uh, reading this, I've, I've brought a few copies. And of course, I'm also very happy to talk about it at any length of time at other occasions. What I want to uh, touch here now uh, are mainly two questions. I don't want so much want to discuss the existence and significance of the parallels, which is beyond any doubt for me, but rather the questions why do they exist and secondly what does the existence imply? What does it imply for science and for society uh, as a whole? However, before discussing these questions, let me very briefly outline the main aspects of the worldview emerging from modern physics. It can be characterized as an organic worldview, a holistic worldview, or if you wish, an ecological, rather than mechanistic and fragmented worldview. In modern physics, as in mystical philosophies and religions, the universe appears as an inseparable, interconnected whole, which cannot be divided into isolated, distinct things or events. In this century, the exploration of the atomic and subatomic world has made it increasingly clear that this world cannot be reduced to any basic building blocks, to any elementary particles or other fundamental constituents. It rather appears as a web or network of complicated relations whose parts are only defined through their connections to the whole. And this universal interwovenness includes not only all objects around us, but also, most importantly, ourselves. In modern physics, we cannot talk about the properties of any object as such. They are only meaningful in the context of the object's interaction with us. Therefore, the scientist can no longer play the role of a detached objective observer, but becomes involved in the world he observes and becomes involved to the extent that he influences the properties of the objects he observes by uh, his method of observation. Uh, it has been suggested by one physicist that we should take this into account by replacing the word observer by the word participator. I think that's quite significant in, in this connection. Now, all these the aspects I've mentioned so far appear 
in quantum theory, which is the theory of atomic phenomena. When we go deeper down into matter, into the atomic nuclei and the subatomic particles, we have to take into account not only quantum theory, but also relativity theory. Now, in relativity theory, uh, as you probably know, space and time are fused into a four-dimensional continuum, which physicists call space-time. Therefore, the particles of the subatomic and subnuclear world cannot be pictured as static three-dimensional objects, but rather have to be conceived as four-dimensional entities in this space-time. They are dynamic patterns which have a space aspect and a time aspect. Their space aspect makes them appear as objects with a certain mass. Their time aspect makes them appear as processes with involving rather a certain energy. And you know that the two are equivalent, mass and energy. This fact that mass is nothing but a form of energy uh, means that these entities are associated with activity, with processes, because energy is associated with activity, with processes. And therefore this implies that the nature of subatomic particles is intrinsically dynamic. Relativity theory then has shown that the activity of matter cannot be separated from its existence, from its being. So, uh, to sum it up, we can say that quantum theory has made us aware that particles are not isolated grains of matter, but are interconnections in an inseparable cosmic web. Relativity theory, so to speak, has made these interconnections come alive by showing their intrinsically dynamic character. The, these interconnections involve a ceaseless flow of energy, a dynamic interplay in which particles are created and destroyed continually. There is a continual variation of energy patterns. The whole universe is engaged in endless motion and activity, if you wish, in a continual cosmic dance of energy. So this is very briefly the picture emerging from modern physics, and all these features appear in one way or in another, in the writings and teachings of mystics. Why then is there this similarities? What do mystics and physicists have in common? Well, I'd like to make just a few very schematic and sketchy remarks to establish a framework for the comparison and to suggest a few points for discussion. First of all, as far as my comparison is concerned, the aim of both physicists and mystics is the same. It's to see into the essential nature of things. And also their method is the same because it is a thoroughly empirical method. Physicists derive their knowledge from experiments, mystics from direct meditative insights. Both are observations, and in both fields, these observations are acknowledged as the only source of knowledge. However, physics and mysticism, or science and mysticism, are two complementary activities. Uh, they can be seen as complementary manifestations of the human mind, of its rational and intuitive faculties. I like to see uh, this part of physics as the extreme specialization of the rational mind and uh, mysticism as the extreme specialization of the intuitive mind. Of course, again, all this is, is very sketchy and, and schematic and simplistic. Uh, an important point, I think, is that the mystical knowledge, in contrast to scientific knowledge, cannot be transmitted verbally, therefore cannot be studied from books. Now, um, the observations made in both fields, that's another point now they have in common, the observations made in both fields take place in a realm which is inaccessible to the ordinary senses. 
In physics, this is the realm of the subatomic world. In mysticism, it's an experience of the world which also, as mystics tell us, transcends sensory perception. And consequently, the essential results of the observations cannot be expressed in ordinary language because ordinary language is derived from uh, our ordinary sensory experience. Again, mysticism and modern physics show here the same uh, features. Furthermore, mystics often talk about higher planes of consciousness, about multidimensional experiences which cannot be expressed in terms of our everyday three-dimensional world. Exactly the same thing happens, or a similar thing happens in physics, where we are forced to work at the four-dimensional level of uh, space-time in our relativistic theories. Uh, finally, one of the main differences between the two fields is that mystics speak about a macroscopic reality, but physicists speak about a submicroscopic world, and yet their results are so similar. How, how, uh, what is the reason then why these similarities uh, exist? How, for example, does the mystic experience the unity uh, of two macroscopic objects, which appears in modern physics at the subatomic level very clearly, but not macroscopically? Could it be that the distinction between macroscopic and microscopic, which is based on measurement and therefore ultimately on the senses, could it be that this distinction is irrelevant in the mystical experience? So all these are questions for further discussion, if you wish. To conclude, um, I want to turn to the question, what are the implications of the profound harmony between uh, the worldviews of modern physics and of mystical thought? And here we are struck immediately by the very different ways in which this knowledge affects the physicist and the mystic. Mystical knowledge cannot be separated from a certain way of life, which is the living manifestation of that knowledge. Uh, to make a contact to the theme of this conference, you could say to acquire this type of knowledge means to undergo a transformation. You could even say the knowledge, the mystical knowledge, is the transformation. Whereas scientific knowledge can stay abstract and theoretical. Today, I think most physicists are not aware of the philosophical, cultural, and spiritual implications of their theories. So the question then is how, how is this possible? Something in the structure of science allows physicists to do research and yet escape the conclusions of this research. How then is this possible? Or is this only a temporary state of affairs? And if so, what can we as scientists do to transform the image of science in order to bring it in harmony with its content? And lastly, what are the implications for society? Now here we have to observe that our technological society is still largely dominated by the mechanistic and fragmented worldview. Science, of course, was originally based on this worldview and developed from it in the days of Descartes, Newton and Laplace. Now, however, science is overcoming the me mechanistic worldview and leads us to the organic, holistic worldview of the mystics. And since the survival of our whole civilization seems to depend on our ability to realize the basic oneness of nature and on our ability to live in harmony with it, it would seem to me a matter of extreme urgency to make the new views of science known, to make them known to the scientists themselves and to the general public. Thank you. Well, perhaps I could add um, a couple of things. One is that um, this presentation of the present status of 
modern physics is very nice and very elegant, uh, but it is the idealistic philosophy of modern physics. It is not the philosophy accepted by most practicing physicists. Most practicing physicists would run away from any holistic interpretation of this kind. They, most practicing uh, theoretical particle physicists always deal with isolated, uh, limited domains of phenomena and uh, would elaborate a philosophy, but would certainly say, if you ask, what about this phenomenon? He says, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in nuclear phenomena. Or I'm interested only in weak interactions. I'm interested only in high energy domain. This is probably necessary because most physics seems to be carried out by large number of peasants, I mean, large number of people who do small pieces of work rather than look at why they do the problem. They do the problem more as a technical task rather than as a general philosophic, general inquiry into the system of things. The second thing is that in um, most physicists that I know of seem to be unable to comprehend a world in which the notions of space and time could be altered that they are now so convinced that there is three dimensions of space and one of time that they would not consider any personal experience that they themselves have about time, space, causality, uh, causation, relation between phenomena as being of any significance that they have already decided that space-time is four-dimensional. Mystical phenomena, on the other hand, I mean, what you included amongst mystical phenomena, are cases in which you experience creativity yourself, spiritual or um, extraordinary states of consciousness, in which it is quite clear that there is more than one uh, level of uh, phenomena in which time occurs. The uh, point that Dr. Capra made about um, physics, modern physics considering as ingredients not only objects, but also organizations and laws and processes, uh, this particular thing, which is certainly seen in mystical or um, uh, spiritual approaches to knowledge, is again not accepted by the physicist in practice anywhere beyond the immediate phenomena that he is dealing with. He would be con willing to consider uh, processes as being ingredients as long as processes are physical processes, but processes as being relevant in terms of personal phenomena. I believe that the majority of theoretical particle physics and probably the most influential and most um, famous amongst them seem to be quite unwilling to consider their personal experience even with regard to physics as being relevant. So while I, I am all in agreement with the desirability of physicists viewing the world the way in which you suggested, I believe that very few people view this. I would like to have your reaction to this. Uh, Yes, I, I think I agree with, with uh, most of what you say. Of course, I have not had time to go into any detail into uh, the, the method of science and so on. And I have not talked at all about the concept of approximation, which is crucial to any scientific work that uh, physicists are aware that all their theories are approximations and do not have an absolute value of truth or do not, do not have an, a permanent value. And that when they isolate phenomena, they uh, can do it only in neglecting other phenomena. But they know, I mean, if they are good physicists, they know that one of the most important things when you build a theory is to establish its limits, to ask why does it work, in what sense is it an approximation, to quantify this approximation, so, so that at a later stage one can go beyond it and, and expand it. It is true, I think what you say is perfectly true, that physicists do not want to consider uh, the world as a unity at large, do not have this holistic view, but Yet, in, in their fields, they are very well aware of the fact that uh, things are interconnected. For instance, in particle physics, they are very well aware, they are forced to be aware, that they will never understand the properties of any single particle 
completely before understanding the properties of all the others. Furthermore, they will never understand the properties of the particles before understanding their mutual interactions, that is, the activity. Properties can only be understood in terms of activity, of processes. And then what you say uh, about their philosophy, well, here you, you more or less echoed what I was saying, that they, they do not, uh, they are not willing to uh, uh, draw the conclusions from the theories in philosophical terms. I think it's quite interesting that this uh, very often is uh, a stumbling block in advance in physics. I think personally that the Greek type of natural philosophy is a great handicap in, in modern physics today, especially in particle physics. There's still a very strong trend to look for elementary constituents of matter. The last ones proposed are the quarks, and there are still a lot of physicists who think that they will, maybe they've given up the hope now of finding the quarks because they haven't been found so far, but they still think that these quarks in some way or the other exist, and that's a central problem of particle physics today. And here I think the, the world view, the Democritian, Newtonian worldview is a great stumbling block for the advance of, of the theories themselves. And if the physicists had been brought up in a mystical environment, well, it, this is difficult to say. You see, I was going to say they would make more progress, but you can't say that because in order to get to where they are now, they had to go through the Newtonian Cartesian phase. This is why I like to say that the two are complementary and what we need is both of them and not any single one. Uh, if not, I'll just say a few words. Uh, uh, just one point. I think that we can't uh, ascribe this view to the Greeks, but rather, as you said later, to Democritus. Uh, say, the Greeks had many philosophical points yes, of view, and yes. you had holistic <coughs> views among the Greeks, and you had uh, Heraclitus, who first proposed that everything flows. Yes, but he was, uh, he was and still is misunderstood by most people. Uh, uh, yeah, but I, I only want to say that the Greeks have uh, espoused almost every view possible, yes, but... Yes. The particular view of the Greeks that has been taken up in modern physics is that of the atomistic view of Democritus, which you have uh, described. Now, the other point uh, what I would like to make is, uh, of course, uh, most physicists are exactly as uh, Dr. Sadashin described, but I think we shouldn't let that weigh too heavily <coughs> on us because we have to proceed in the way that's right, not according to the way that uh, the most physicists uh, believe. And that's true, not only the whole purpose of our conference is to look at questions which most people in the world would not be willing at present to look at, <laughs> because somebody has got to begin. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, does anybody want to comment any further on this paper, or this uh, talk? I wanted to say one thing, uh, Dr. Schoenberg is my name. Uh, that your point that you had to go through the Newtonian phase in order to get to the other phase is really something that I think maybe we will keep coming back to in the conference because I think it's implicit, for instance, in such things as uh, Zen meditation and those sorts of transformative processes where one sits and discovers the limits of one's own thought and then the transformation occurs. And I think in some way this discovery of the limitations of the Newtonian phase so that there's a breakthrough or transformation is something of the same uh, process at a different level. I'll come back to that in my paper. Yes, uh, I would like at some later point to discuss this question, why is the similarity between the mystical worldview and the worldview of modern physics. It's a question which, which I'm puzzled by and which I'm very interested in. And if anybody wants to discuss it with me at any time, I'd be very happy to. Could I make one more? Uh, Sudarshan. Do we, in uh, talking about physics, um, like Dr. Kapra, I'm also a physicist, and uh, in a certain sense I could talk about it at three possible, discuss things at three possible levels. One is, as a practicing physicist, what I have found. Second, what the profession, what the people talk about. And third, how I could view it if I wanted to. Um, 
Now, these three are, need not be all distinct, but usually they are distinct. In the same sense, with regard to mysticism also, or mystical knowledge, again, one can talk about what is talked about them, what, how it may be viewed, or in terms of one's own personal experience with regard. Now, during these deliberations, are we going to talk about personal experiences also? Well, I think I have to leave that up to the, each individual. Whatever he sees fit is the, you know, the most appropriate uh, way. Um, because otherwise, um, we would be talking, I mean, scholarly discussions about things, and it would have very little genuine content about the possibility of transformation. It would be like saying that if you people want to be transformed, this is what you should do. Not a case of saying that, assurance, saying, I have tried it, and this works, and therefore, experimentally, this is a, empirically, this is a valid means of transformation. Well, I would say that there's some uh, value in both methods, that we should have some general discussion, and we should also have a, a particular experience of the individual brought in if he feels that he can. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, and does anybody want to make any more comments? In that case, and we'll end this, and we have just a short moment to allow the microphone to be changed. And before, then I'll have to ask who, since we've changed the plan, I'll go just through the paper. Are you ready, Dr. Ferris, now? Yeah. No, then, right, then whenever you're ready. The next one would be uh, Dr. Globus, you're ready, but... A few days ago, we um, got off the boat at Southampton. We were driving our camper, which we'd been traveling in for a number of months. We got out on the British highways, and in about five minutes, I was absolutely terrified. And I sought refuge in a gas station. When the gas station attendant came up, I went through my habitual song and dance about getting gas, which I had learned. And that is, I pointed at the tank that I wanted to fill the gas in, and I pointed at my gas tank, and I took a couple pounds out and showed him a couple pounds and went like this. He was very silent. He filled it up. And after a couple minutes, suddenly I said to him, Oh, you speak English. <laughs> and I explained to him that I'd been traveling and I couldn't speak Arabic, and I couldn't speak Turkish, and this was just my song and dance for, for getting gasoline. And as I was about to drive away, the attendant came over to me, and with a slight smile on his face, and he said, most of us speak English here. I think you'll be all right now, sir. <laughs> and it's with that... Uh, kind of feeling that I come to this conference uh, uh, with the feeling that most of us speak the same language here, that we can understand each other, and uh, I'm hopeful that I'll be all right here. Uh, however, despite the, the commonalities of our, of our interests, and I think the real possibilities that we can talk together, uh, I want to indicate a bit of which side of the road I'm used to driving on uh, in order to avoid head-on collisions. So I, I want to mention a few points of view that I have which I, I think would, would uh, be in disagreement with Krishnamurti and with uh, David to the extent that I understand their points of view and just indicate a little bit of how I go about thinking about the world because there are a few differences. Now, Krishnamurti makes the point, which I think is an extremely good point, that, that we must look at ourselves without condemnation to, to appreciate ourselves as we are, to understand our own hatred and our own greed. Uh, we can't condemn ourselves as we do this. And in so doing, we can 
avoid the bifurcation between the observer and the observed, which is a root cause of our difficulties. Now, I think it is very important to extend this, this uh, notion to our attitude towards society at large, because I think to the extent that we condemn society as hateful, as greedy, as destructive, uh, rather than simply appreciating it as it is, that we bifurcate our group vis-a-vis -vis that other group. And I think this was part of what we were discussing last night. I think it's the same, the same issue. Um, I, so I think we tend to reiterate the problems of uh, the, a group um, which sees itself in a special kind of way vis-a-vis -vis all other groups when we adopt uh, an attitude of condemnation towards the world around us. Now, I, I, feel, I feel tremendously outraged at times, but it's a feeling that I really struggle to, uh, to not hold on to. And I, I would like to um, transcend my feeling of outrage at what's going on in the world. So I, I try to see myself in society in, in a very broad perspective, in a long evolutionary perspective, realizing I have a very narrow time window to look at it through. I find that... Um, I'm a good deal more optimistic about the world than, than, for example, David was expressing last night. I'm not as optimistic as Chardin. I don't think the Omega point is close at hand. But I, am, uh, I feel enormous progress has been made. And I think that there are many enlightened people in the world. I think there are more enlightened people in the world now than there ever has been. I think the kids today are much better than the, than the kids when I was a kid. And I think, uh, I think this, that kind of measure leads me to be, to be rather hopeful. This is perhaps a temperamental difference. Um, and I can only say that, that my image of the world is a more optimistic image than the one that you were presenting last night. Now, I suppose that it's the uh, business of the branch of knowledge called history to, to try and decide such questions in an untemperamental way. But I think both my view and your view are, are images in, in Krishnamurti's sense, applied to the world. And I think we ought to try and step back from those images of the world as uh, making inherent progress or at the cataclysm of destruction being very bad. Uh, a second area that I, that I want to mention has to do with the self, with, with the observer. And I'm of the opinion here that there's been a, a philosophical era uh, permeating British philosophy since Hume, and I think it's partially reflected in Krishnamurti's thought, uh, having to do with the denial of the self as, as an entity. Hume, on examining his consciousness, was unable to find his self, and I don't think that there has been a British philosopher who has found himself since. Uh, Krishnamurti finds himself, but he, he tells us that the self is an observed datum, if I understand him co correctly, quite like any other, uh, ultimately based on sensory impressions and based on memories. To the contrary, I, I find myself very real. And I, I find myself important. I have to, this is, this is the way it is for me. And I also find myself very different from my sensory impressions of the world. I want to convey uh, a little bit of how I think of self, because I think of it perhaps in a little different way. Uh, I think of self as a, as a qualia of experience, or a context of experience, rather than a content. And let, let me explain what I mean by a qualia of experience, by using the example of synesthesias. Um, 
Perhaps you've had the experience of lying with your eyes shut and being kind of quiet, and there'll be a loud sound, and you'll see a flash of light at the same time that you hear the sound. For example, I was once sort of half dozing, and one of my children dropped a toy on the floor, and it made a harsh grating sound. I saw a jagged flash of light at the same moment. This is a synesthesia. Well, the... With eyes closed? With eyes closed, yes. Uh, now, the information, the input to the brain is the single, is a single input, but we have cross-talk into a visual modality from, from the auditory input. Uh, the information in both situations is the same, but the auditory qual is irrevocably different from the visual qual. There's something about seeing which simply is different from hearing and which is different from touching, which we cannot describe these differences in words, but yet we all can distinguish seeing from hearing, and I could easily distinguish the sound, the harsh grating sound, from the flash of light. So there's a, a visual qual, an auditory qual, a, a qual of taste, of smell, the classic sensory quals. I like to think of self as a qual, too. Excuse me, what is it? Quality? Uh, quality yes, like a, it's, um, yes, in the sense of quality. Um, I'm using the terms qual as singular and qualia as plural. The qualia of experience referring to the various, the various quals that I'm talking about. So in, in this sense, the self is a, is a basic modality of experience, very much like seeing is a basic modality of experience. And just as I believe that the visual qual has to do with the particular organization of the visual system, that the way that that particular system is built to process input and pinging upon it, which differs from the particular way the auditory system is built, um, I believe that this qual of self has to do with the particular organization of a very high order system within the brain, some kind of monitoring system which processes data from other systems, which controls other systems. That what I want to say is that the neural basis for self as a qualia, as a qual of experience, has to do with very high order neural systems. And since I since I find myself, and since I believe there's a neural basis for this. Um, I think we, we really have to accept the self as, as a given. And uh, I also find that the self is concerned with its, with its own interests. And here I find myself not agreeing with Krishnamurti and very much agreeing with Freud, uh, believing that there are very deep biological roots to self-interest. Uh, Freud would discuss this generally under the topic of narcissism. So I think that, that narcissism is inherent to the, to the human condition, that it cannot entirely be accounted for by conditioning, although clearly conditioning can make people more self-interested, more narcissistic. But I think there's a biological core here. It's the way the brain is built to work. And I think any approach to transforming man and society which does not uh, fully acknowledge the, the biological roots of self-interest, the biological roots of narcissism, is being a bit visionary. I think this is a given which we have to, which we have to deal with. Now, I think this is something interesting to discuss. I present this as kind of a bias that I have. I think that the Self-interest of a group has biological roots, too. Uh, if one travels around the world, the nationalism is, is so striking. Uh, in every country that one goes, people seem to feel that they're really better than other people. Uh, it's such uh, a universal phenomenon that, again, and again following Freud, that I, I tend to look for biological roots here. And I, I think in terms of Oh, the 
anxiety at strangeness, the anxiety at things which are different, the, which are based upon biological things like the orienting response. Which the brain is built to orient at things which are new. It doesn't really feel good to be orienting all the time. To be with a different culture, with a different group, is anxiety producing. And as I go from country to country, I feel more anxious than I do at home. I'll, I'll never feel as comfortable in an Arab marketplace as in a California supermarket. At least it would take me a long time to habituate. This is partially my rigidity in facing new situations, but I don't think it's entirely my rigidity. I think my brain is built to orient, to, to orient uh, and respond in this way when unfamiliar stimuli impinge upon me. I, I think we just have to acknowledge this. Now, now, despite these kinds of disagreements that I mentioned, I, I think I, I'm in very basic agreement with uh, Krishnamurti and with David and with the staff at, at Brockwood um, in their focus on people and the, the transformation of people as being the, the ultimate way that uh, a society is going to be transformed. That is to say, I don't think the problem is with knowledge. Uh, I think knowledge is really good. Uh, I don't think the problem is with science. It's the problem with scientists. It's the problem with ac academicians, as we were just discussing. And the question is, how can we get phys physicists to see things in the broader, holistic way, as, as we were just discussing a moment ago? I have to say that in my field of psychiatry, I, I am as pessimistic as you are about the physicists. Uh, as I think of the full professors in my department, I think it's very unlikely that they're going to be enlightened. Uh, and I'm not about to expend any more of my energy in that direction. H however, with students, I think we can really be much more hopeful. And I think to the extent that we can pass on the particular ways of thinking that we have to students, as is done at Brockwood Park, I think that's really the way to go. And also I think uh, that conferences like this are really very important to, to help us get centered in our mind what we're doing in teaching, because I often forget about the, the broader implications of my role as a teacher. And I'm just very forcibly reminded, being here, about my responsibilities, which I greatly neglect. I often teach psychiatry and don't teach about, uh, don't pass on to the students my broader views of the world. So this is very useful to me, and I uh, very much support the, the, the kind of educational program that you have at Brockwood and the notion of having a conference like this. I'm very much in agreement there. Uh, well, I'm give your name, please. Omen. Uh, the psychiatrists are in a minority here, and I don't want to split the ranks, but I do have to take some exception to some of the points you made. Uh, when we see very sick patients, one of the uh, difficulties in, 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 in uh, affecting change with them is that uh, the nature of the psychopathological process is such that it carries its own uh, carries with it its own anesthetic equipment, so to speak, so that the, the difficulty we're up against is that the patient is, unaw uh, is unaware, profoundly unaware, of the unintended consequences of his behavior, its impact on other people. And uh, uh, when that's uh, uh, written large, uh, at a social level, uh, um, we have a situation where ever larger groups of people, as a consequence of, um, of uh, many uh, perhaps unfortunate historical accidents and development, uh, have come to a point where uh, large groups of people, societies in fact, are profoundly unaware of the uh, destructive fallout of their own 
policies and uh, uh, attitudes toward other nations and so on. Stupefied, in other words. Exactly. Well, uh, the point here is that the only, the only uh, hope of uh, coming to terms with a situation like that is to nurture whatever sense of outrage is still left. I think what we've tended to do, it seems to me, is, uh, is sort of delegate the formal aspects of outrage to the younger generation. And we, more uh, sane individuals, simply uh, lived comfortably uh, within the framework of the anesthetic uh, cocoon that uh, we really exist. Uh, I think if we let ourselves be sensitive to the enormous suffering in the world, it would be hard to uh, live with ourselves. Uh, now, the second point uh, had to do with your concept of narcissism, which I could perhaps ag agree with you. I think it is a bias. I think we simply come into the world with, with, with a profound plasticity to be part of the, the world, the world about us. And uh, unfortunately, it's molded into a narcissistic framework simply because uh, uh, our emphasis has been on fragmentation, on uh, uh, accentuating the limits of the self rather than the aspirations and potential of the self to, to transcend itself. Uh, so I too uh, have experienced a sense of culture shock in, in removing myself to a foreign country recently, um, and it was a culture shock. Uh, not as profound as yours because in Sweden most people speak English fortunately, uh, but it is somewhat. And I don't really think that there's a built-in uh, uh, xenophobic mechanism uh, out of proportion that can in any way really be significantly related to the problems that, uh, that create nationalism and ultimately wars. I think, I think, I think that's somewhat reductionist. Okay. Uh, Shane Berg <coughs> is my name. Uh, I wanted to make a couple of points because it seems there is a correlation to what uh, you were saying, Dr. Capra, in, in uh, Dr. Globus's point about uh, narcissism. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, just to take Freud's theory, I think Freud's theory of narcissism had more to do with a, uh, a belief that this self-involvement was a... Um, he, he didn't distinguish qualitatively between self-interest and a kind of compulsive self-involvement. In other words, narcissism for Freud was uh, that self-love, which was really a form of self-inflation that was secondary to a sense of basic anxiety. And he didn't really, I think it was in, in basically in psychoanalytic theory, it was Horney that interjected and introduced the notion that there was such a thing as a uh, self-interest that was uh, genuine and spontaneous and was not a secondary form of clinging, so to speak. So that Freud talked about narcissism where people clung to themselves to protect themselves from this feeling of basic anxiety about being in the world. I, I mean primary narcissism. narcissism. Well, I, I, I don't want to get into that too much because I think when we talk about primary narcissism, we open up a whole nother bag. But just taking this distinction between uh, a kind of compulsive uh, self-holding and a, so to speak, letting oneself open up to one's own self-processes where there's a spontaneous evolution of, of growth, that's something a little bit uh, different that, uh, that I was uh, suggesting. But the thing that occurs to me is if you take that distinction and then you start, uh, you take your uh, notion of uh, the higher order self, which is integrating these uh, qualia. In other words, there's qualia coming in and you're experiencing qualia, which are then organized into some sort of self. Now, if that organization process is something that's protective and closing, then it will be a limited form of organization of these qualia, which I think follows into what Dr. Capra was calling a Newtonian view. Whereas on the contrary, if you had an open organization of self that could allow these qualia to take many different forms, in other words, I hear, have the synesthesia and I might even recombine into another kind of form, or I might, have another, I might let break open the synesthesia 
and have the auditory and the visual separate. In other words, if I was able to have that kind of breaking open rather than I had the synesthesia and that was the only, only experience of self I could have, then I think you could conceive of an organizing process that would allow yourself to fall into a Newtonian view or fall into a more open uh, view of the universe and you could move more freely. But the problem has been, as Monty said, that we've, we've fallen into a fragmentation view which it seems absolutely necessary. So I think it, 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 it depends on how you look at narcissism and depends on if, you, if the self is something that's absolutely necessary to hold on to, then of course you have to have this rigid form of yourself and you can't experience what David has called the implicate order. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to criticize this view about biological conditioning. Um, it's a nativistic view that, that um, because of the way the human race has evolved, its ancestry, we have various inbuilt uh, qualities like self which are inherent in, our, in us. Well, I think this is a dangerous sort of view to take because it makes us uh, unwilling to look at other possibilities. And uh, in fact, if you do look at uh, anthropologically at other races, other states of mankind, one finds there's a tremendous variation in the ways in which individuals have expressed themselves and do. And even within our own cultures there are very big variations. And so I think that um, it's, it's a little bit dangerous to, to argue in this biological kind of way for certain characteristics being natural to us. You mean that there are no natural Well, um, I don't know. I mean, one has to find out. One, I don't think it's possible about to... about the ability to speak as mm. you're speaking now? Well, I speak differently from a Chinese person. Fine. But the ability to speak mm. is still... Biological. Yes, I think you've got, yes. you've got the message. Oh, yes. In other words, there are certain basic biological givens, but the form in which they come through, whether it's Chinese or English and so on, seems to be very highly dependent on conditioning, if you want to call it, or learning, or whatever. Yes. But, the, but don't deny the nativistic business that something is different about us. Yes. I, I, I think I'm thinking of it in a, in, in a much more primordial level. I, I quite agree with what you're saying, but I still think there's a primordial level, something like this. The, the, the seat of pleasurable sensations is experienced within the body. You know, that's the way the brain is built. We experience, you know, we experience pleasure in our genitals, not out there. You know, it, it's in our genitals. It, now that ha has enormous consequences. People are very interested in their genitals. They protect them. Um, I, I think it's that. When you, it's when that, you that, this to society and to the, the people necessarily taking a self-interest and even uh, being basing their lives on pleasure then I think you're getting into danger because you're preventing possible changes in one's whole outlook. Uh, I think that, excuse me, problem is my name, by the way. Um, I think that, that this setting up of dichotomies is not good. Mm -hmm. I think the language example is, is the best one. I mean, you do have certain inherent capabilities, but the way in which they're expressed is so pleomorphic in, in man because he has this uh, general purpose instrument in his head uh, that can allow it to go one way or another that uh, I mean I agree with both of you in essence I think it's dangerous to overdo the nativistic element and say gee we've got to have a society which is just this way because uh, we're born this way quite the contrary we're born in such a way that um, we have these tremendous potentialities, and, and that's really the message I got from yes, Gordon. Sir. And uh, Dr. Melzack. my name. Yes, sir, I'd just like to make um, a comment on the dichotomy that you made, as it were, placing yourself, or juxtaposing yourself uh, against people like David Bowen, etc. And it had to do with your uh, remark on Hume. I mean, you felt that Hume was a precursor of the sorts of views that some people in the room hold, and uh, you put forward your own view as that which was somehow opposed to that view. 
And I think that that's actually a mistaken way of looking at Hume. I mean, it's true that in the section of the particular text that I think you were referring to, he said that when I look inward, I find nothing but a bundle of perceptions or impressions and ideas. But then in a very important appendix, which sometimes is overlooked, he feels that, I mean, he claimed, he state, states explicitly that he must posit, he calls it this fiction, in order to underlie and support the discrete impressions and ideas, i.e. his perceptions. And I think that when you say the self is necessary to hold on to, I think this is exactly what Hume meant in the appendix when he said it's a fiction that I must posit. And indeed, really, Hume was doing, I think, a very respectable scientific method. He was doing the sorts of things that physicists do when they have to posit entities in order to explain what they observe. So Hume wasn't denying the self, in your sense. I think Hume was actually... Hume would have, if he was sitting here, agreed with you and said, except that... Except that he would have not, well, he would have said, oh, it's interesting, maybe it's not a fiction. In other words, he would have quantified over things that we can't observe directly. So he might have struck the word fiction. But still, I think his view is identical to your view, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, uh, the ontology of the self. And therefore, I think there really isn't that much of a difference between your view and the view, say, that Bohm holds. Yes, does that, someone else want to comment? I would like to ask, sir. Uh, not having read Freud, not having read any philosophy or psychology and so on, I'd like to ask, what is the self, actually? Not theoretically, not uh, as an idea, but in daily life, what is the self? Why should we cling to the self? If, this, if self interest is so colossally important, apparently it is now, it is like building a fence around oneself and not allowing anything to enter. So I'd like to ask, if I may, what do we mean by this word? What not Freud or some. You, in your daily life, in your daily activity, in your appreciation of things and observation, what is this center which we call the self? You understand my position? Yes, yes. And, and I, I tried to convey some of what I thought it was when I um, referred to it as one of the qualia of experience uh, as... Like a quality? Like a quality, yes. Uh, quality. May I try to help answer the question? Yes, but please. Not necessarily agreeing with you, but um, somewhat the thoughts that have come to me in answering your question. Um, the philosophers have made a distinction in, in people at least, Brentano especially, uh, that People, for some reason or other, are able to tell the difference between what they perceive and that they are perceiving, or at least simultaneously appreciate the fact that the perceiver and the perceived are not identical. And in infants, this happens sometime during the first two years of life, around usually 12 months, 14 months, when they begin to distinguish the mother from themselves. And this has given rise to the idea that perhaps there is a self which is doing no, the perceiving. But, uh, my question, if I may interrupt, yes. is in our daily life, yes. apart from all the theories and right. speculations, what is the self? What is me? Well, it is this ability to distinguish between that which is perceived and the fact that the perception is taking place. It is a distinction, in other words. And, I'm, and the monitoring aspect of it uh, may be one part of the brain. I'm not so sure it's all that high. Uh, that's the only a reservation I would have. But the idea that one can monitor the difference between perceiving and the perceived and the perceived. And it's therefore a, a, a distinction that is made. Now whether is, that's learned... Is that, is that the me, sir? 
Is that the ego, the me, the self? I'm told, I'm asking, yeah. if I may, what do we mean by that word around which we function all the time? Well, me, I want to be the, <coughs> the professor, I want to be the great man, I'm suffering, I'm having pleasure, I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm bully, and so on, so on. What is that area which we call the self? And yeah. which we, to which we cling to. Why? Well, I'm not so sure people all cling to it. It has to do with the problem of projection. All of our, all of our perceptions take place at our body surfaces, one way or another. Uh, when I see an object, I really don't see it out there. I see it on my retina, in a sense and yet I project it out there. There are certain neural mechanisms that allow me to project certain images out into the world, and, they, and then I say, that exists out there. So that's artificial right there. Now, when I, do the, when I can't do that, then I attribute these things to another entity which I call myself. Are you saying, sir, I project the various images, and those images are different from me, Having projected them, I separate myself from it, from them, and say I'm different, and therefore I, the observer, and the thing is observed. And it, it's quite artificial, but it happens. I know it happens. Is that the movement of the self? I think I can construct as the self. I mean, I'm just talking neurologically and biologically. Yeah. I'm not putting any. Uh, and therefore, it can be broken down. I mean, if we begin to realize that we, when we sit on a tack, that we feel it up here, really, and not down here, uh, all of this begins to break down. But our Western ways of, of talking about this distinction have been to say, ah, here is a self, and here is the outside no, no, world. Yes, and it doesn't have to be that way, but this is the way most of us have learned to talk about it and think about it. Well, but you said it didn't have to be that way, but if the child learns it and discovers at 12 that there's a difference, you're suggesting it has to be that way. Well, let me go back to Freud, for instance. One way of talking about it is to, to talk about the images of objects, that really we're perceiving it. And in all of the psychiatric things, we're dealing with interpersonal relationships and transactions. One of the difficulties is saying the relationship is now in this state, and what most people say, oh, well, it's your fault. And some people say it's my fault. When actually it's the relationship, which is always what is in jeopardy or what has happened is the relationship. Well, this is true of the physical world also. We say, gee, you know, there's a microphone out there. Rather than a microphone out there, there's an image of on my retina produced by my lens, which my brain perceives of something which I have learned to say is out there, and, and I sort of transcend the idea because, you know, I can feel it too with other senses, and so I finally say, oh, hell with it, it's, it's out there. Let's just skip all this image of and so on and just talk about it as if it really were out there. We've learned to do it this way, shortcuts. It may get you into trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't know how much people want to go on Perhaps with, 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 the, with the discussion of self. We could... Perhaps we could we'll, do it for a long time. And perhaps we'll return to this discussion. I think it's good that it has been introduced because I think it's going to be a key point as we go along. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, one, one short thing I wanted to say to, to uh, Monty. Um, because I don't, I don't think we're really in disagreement. Uh, I think it's possible to be activist without being outraged. I don't think the sense of outrage is necessary for activism. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think when outrage <coughs> accompanies activism, then we create the very, we reiterate the very situation that we're trying to deal with. That is, a group which has a special position, which is outraged about things around them, which is, reiterates the problem that we see over and over again with uh, special interest groups everywhere. And I think the, the way that the model for dealing with that is to be activist without any outrage, very much in the way that, that I like so much that Krishnamurti talks about looking at ourselves without outrage.
I think we should look at society without outrage. It's the way it is, and let's see what we can do about it. Sir, but don't you say when you go to India or one of those Eastern African countries where there is so much poverty, mm. starvation, real poverty and starvation, people are not sufficiently outraged. They say yes. In India, they say, I was walking once down a hill and there was a mother and a her daughter. The mother was, the daughter was asking, Mummy, Mother, may I have some more food? And the mother says, No, you can't, I give you your last meal just now. That's the meal for the day. He said, But I want more. And the mother says, It's our karma. You understand, sir? It's our. They put up with it. Then it's not said, For God's sake, let's change this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say much the same thing, that uh, I think that it's possible to have some sense of, uh, I mean, of being deeply moved by the situation and see how destructive it is. As a matter of fact, this is not a condemnation, but if you see somebody taking a sledgehammer and smashing the room up, you must say he's destructive. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a plain fact. And, uh, and you must say, I feel impelled to stop this destruction. Now, uh, I'm not condemning him. I say, perhaps if I understood him more deeply, I'd understand why he's so <clears throat> destructive. But uh, the fact is that uh, destruction is going on universally. And this is what I tried to convey last night. Yes, and also, uh, politically in the world of, political world in America, nobody is concerned morally. You follow, sir? Mm -hmm. It's but an outrageous are. thing. Oh, but they are. I think that what Gordon was saying that, that I approve of is we don't have to be pessimistic at the same time that we're outraged. In other is words, that, I don't think we have to be outraged. Yes, he, he, he you don't think you have to. I, I, I believe we, we, we should be outraged, actually. And that, well, that, what, do, what do we yeah. need the outrage for? If we're going to take action, why do we have well, to be outraged with... What, what with do we act with? We act with our feelings. Our feelings are the cement that hold us together. Feelings are not... Fragmenting pseudo feelings, neurotic feelings, phony feelings, counterfeit feelings are separating. Real feelings are the same quality as love. Whether it's whether it's anger or outrage, it's it's a connecting link, trying to keep the harmony that should exist in the world about us. It's, I, I think acting out of love is quite different from acting out of outrage. I don't think that it's the it, it's being indig it's the indignant attitude which bifurcates... You're, you're, you're adding uh, uh, something now. No. You can add arrogance and you transform it into something else. We're talking just about a sense of outrage as a real feeling. I'm not putting it in the context of cynicism or uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a, a, a uh, looking down or, 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 or destroying anything. I'm talking about acting to preserve a harmony, not to fragment it. I think so, Dr. Lewis probably means, if I may talk for you, that outrage does not produce the same action as love. Love is not an outrage. It acts, it feels, it, it has this sense of immediate communication and action. Outrage, you organize, you follow all that's involved in it. But I think where there is this sense of fair play, sense of love and all that, that's quite a different thing from being outrageously uh, active and trying to change people. I think that's what, at least that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my best last time. But there are some, uh, I appreciate what Monty's saying, because um, <laughs> I also under, I think I understand what you're saying, but then I'll, let me give you an example just to try to throw light on why some of us think that outrage is perhaps not necessary but will spurn us to action more than just concern. I mean, we might read a newspaper about some atrocity that we read about. Now, um, if we're at all human, we'll all be concerned about it. But then we might just sit there and say, oh, that's terrible. We're concerned about it. It's terrible. Now, I can't be, I, I can't be more than just intuitive about the way I feel. If one feels something more, if something, as it were, snaps, if one becomes outraged, then the probability, at least, will be more that we'll actually do something about whatever we've just read about. And I think that's what you had in mind. In other words, concern is too cool or too... There's too much of an absence of whatever spurns us to action. So that outrage, 
Although there's tints of negativism about that feeling, it's perhaps necessary to spur us to doing something positive. Maybe, or maybe just growing a better wheat will do the job, I think is what you're talking about. Sort of, in other words, a cool approach of some action that will actually do something, let's say starv starvation in, in India. Could I use the word mm -hmm. responsibility, sir? It'd be better. I mean, if we feel responsible, the ability to respond, meaning yeah. response, responsibility, and all the rest response. Of it. If ability. I feel responsible, I act. I create the environment. I talk about it. I feel about it. I, it is burning in me. And, and, and it's the understanding of how we fail in being responsible, which I think is really important to get at, yeah, yeah. rather than using outrage as a spur. Yeah to get us to do something. I think you're confusing rage and outrage. <laughs> well, perhaps, uh, and I think we more or less agree now. Uh, every, I mean, the point is fairly clear. Um, Let me just ask, do you want one, to ask something? One, one question. Uh, uh, did I, uh, sorry, uh, Morris Wilkins. Yes. Um, did I, did one of the speakers suggest that it was artificial for the child to recognize some distinction between itself and its mother. I said that this is learnt and that has certain implications which I didn't mean. Uh, I didn't mean that it's artificial at all. Uh, it's a developmental thing that happens in humans because of the way the organism is constructed, that he begins to differentiate the outside world from the inside world, as it were. Uh, it's a developmental thing. However, it probably wouldn't take place if there weren't social stimulation and so on, or at least we don't know whether it would. It's like sensory deprivation experiments have shown that our normal biological uh, equipment just doesn't develop properly without these inputs. So learning wasn't quite the right word. It's a combination of learning and development. We, we don't have a very good word for it. The two are so intermeshed. Does that answer your question? What was the use of the word artificial, I think, which I'm a little lost on? Uh, oh, maybe we can Do you feel that we wouldn't want to use the word artificial? In? I don't think it's artificial. No, he I says it's biological. He doesn't given. think it's artificial. And I think you got the impression of it being artificial because I used the word learning, mm -hmm. which means it's it's conditioned only, and I didn't mean to imply that. Right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll go on to the next uh, speaker. Now, I'm not quite sure it will be. A, is, are you ready, Dr. Goodwin? Yeah. Uh, very well. Then we'll just leave a moment to move the microphone. Well, my, my professional field is developmental biology, that is the study of the uh, transformation of form in um, embryos and regenerating systems. And so this, the study of transformation is very much a part of uh, my everyday work. And I think that um, I was led to this type of prof professional activity through the intuition that transformation um, is a necessary part of the biological process at all levels of its manifestation. Um, now the study of morphogenesis, pattern formation in developing systems, uh, taught me something about hierarchy and heterarchy, that is to say, about the relationship between levels of behavior and their meanings, and that is about parts and wholes, the relationships between parts and wholes. And I find that the meaning or the significance of an activity is provided by its context, which, of course, is just the set of constraints which define the next level of order. And I can 
use examples from the biological system in order to illustrate this at a very elementary level. Um, in molecular biology, which is concerned with the causal interactions of individual molecules, um, we have uh, well-defined processes uh, which are concerned with the synthesis of types of molecules, like proteins. Um, and this, of course, can be understood at the level of the interactions of the molecules, um, but we cannot understand the significance of the synthesis of protein uh, at a particular point in time and in space within a cell unless we consider some aspect of the cell organization. In other words, we have to go to the next level of order in order to understand why that particular process <coughs> is occurring. We can understand how it's occurring, of course, um, without inquiring to the higher order level. A particular example for those of you who are molecular biologists, which I think are probably very few, probably Robin is the only one who was, no longer is, and uh, Professor Wilkins. Um, the synthesis of uh, a molecule, of uh, a permease molecule, for example, in a bacterium, uh, can be understood causally at one level, but its function is, is only to be understood in relation to the cell as a whole. Um, well, I now take the view that organisms are, in fact, <coughs> cognitive systems in the sense that they function on the basis of knowledge of themselves and of their environments. And this can be made into a perfectly self-consistent um, uh, definition of knowledge defined um, as a useful representation of some aspect of the world or of the self. In other words, organisms work in terms of useful representations, and that I regard as, as knowledge. Um, now, the hierarchical nature of the system is a very central feature. If we come on to cognition itself, that is the domain of um, uh, cognitive processes in, in human beings, then I tend to see by analogy uh, the same hierarchical principles at work. That is, the problem of meaning is always that of finding the context of an action. Um, or of discovering the appropriate relationship between a context and act activity, that is, the fitting mode of behavior, or, as David Bowen put it last night, the artful or the skillful mode of behavior within the context. We tend, in general, to operate cognitively in the West uh, on one major level, uh, which is that which is dominated by sense experience. Um, it's the physical mode of perception, and philosophers such as um, Michael Whiteman, well, he's not so much a philosopher, actually, as a mathematician, a physicist, and a mystic, um, calls this the mode of simple fixation, but, but other f philosophers have designated this mode uh, in rather similar, uh, similar ways. Now, in order to discover a meaning for the physical world, um, I feel compelled... Uh, to posit uh, the existence of a context within which the physical world uh, becomes manifest. In other words, um, some context which transcends the immediate physical domain. And this is the notion, of course, of hierarchy and context, in complete analogy with what happens in the biological system. So what I uh, believe at the moment, in, in uh, the state of development that I'm in, is that there is a domain of order which has well-defined laws which can be perceived when the appropriate mode of cognition is actually developed um, and which defines the, the constraints that govern the physical domain. Um, the relationship between the higher order field, I use the term field, again in analogy with the, the biological situation in which we have a field that organizes the system globally, and then within this field there are particular processes going on, um, spatially and temporally ordered by that field. Um, the relationships between the higher order field and the lower order manifestation are those governing what, what we call creative activity. This is the way I would look at it. And if we're not aware of the global field, um, 
then our activity will be of an extremely local nature. It'll be inharmonious in relation to the whole. Um, in the same way, the cancerous growth is out of harmony with the whole, and a cancer is something which is not, so the cells within the tumorous tissue are not communicating with the whole. They've broken contact with it. They have their own local laws of organization, but of course they don't contribute to the, the harmony of the whole entity, the organism. Um, and we, we can become aware of the field, the higher order context, by developing higher modes of cognition. Um, and this I understand to be the process of initiation, as it's described in esoteric traditions. Um, uh, initiation? Initiation. In the same way that Castaneda was initiated, or Don Juan tried to initiate uh, Castaneda. Um, uh, when we have been initiated, then of course we can see, uh, we can perceive um, a larger element uh, than we were able to perceive before. We can perceive the context which gives meaning to local action. Um, and the problem of transformation for me is, is that of actually developing such perception. And um, I am certainly very pleased to have had the opportunity to come here to find out how other people uh, think about this process. Um, and what forms of perception are felt to be necessary. Um, but I think that with such higher order perceptions, we can begin to function creatively in such a way that, that our creations have a global meaning, meaning. That is, they fit into the field which can order our behavior cooperatively rather than destructively. Um, but Again, and this is perhaps a personal, uh, probably it's certainly a personal limitation, I feel a need for models for this uh, to draw our imagination or draw my imagination in the right direction. Um, these models, of course, come from many sources. They come from poetry, from music, from science, from mathematics. Um, but in science, I think we need models for the process of manifestation of creative vision. Um, we actually, I believe, create the physical world in some way. We bring it into manifestation. Uh, only if we constrain our creativity to be consistent with the higher order, uh, order, higher level order, will it result in some kind of harmony. Um, so we have to learn to see, and we must be initiated. And this is not a single step. I believe that there are many steps. That is, there's a first initiation, and a second, and a third there is, again, the hierarchy of perception um, that uh, is necessary if we're to get higher and higher levels of um, activity which result in greater degrees of cooperation. Now, just to, to end, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to read you some extracts from a particular model which I have come across quite recently um, it comes from the, the Pythagorean tradition, uh, which relates music and mathematics. And the metaphor for the description of the hierarchy or the unfolding of uh, manifestations from one level to another is primarily in terms of um, uh, sound and number. And, of course, this kind of writing should be understood in a divinatory manner, uh, listening for the meaning, as David Bohm uh, suggested, we, sh we should all listen to each other. Um, I'll just read out some extracts from this material uh, to give you a flavor of the sort of model that I find necessary and which I would like to have articulated more, if at all possible, during the course of this, this conference. Um, in the first beginnings, sound governs number. And, nev gum and number governs all creation. Sound, being the creator of number, is in its unfolding limited by its own creation. The laws of mathematics which pr proceed from sound lead towards the understanding of music. Any single sound has the power of synchronization with all other sounds, and also the power of creating all other sounds. Any point in space or moment in time has the capacity to vibrate to or to express all space and all experience of time, 
although each sound, point or moment, has a definite individuality. The one is whole in the many, and selfness is of the essence of all things. From the complication of vibrations, or sounds, forms and their progeny, comes density, which is complication. Knowledge comes through the resolution of complication into greater and greater simplicity. The art of resolution is the art of life. In this knowledge, the arts and the sciences are not separated. Since this separation occurred, science has lost its creativeness and art has lost its power. The two must now re-become one. Knowledge cannot be obtained without union. Every vibration has a being or consciousness. The cosmos and everything in it are structures of vibrations. Man is so constructed that he may reach every one of these separate structures by becoming one with them and by using the knowledge of the coordination of vibrations. All practice must follow intuition until the center of knowledge begins to energize within. The way of true science is the way of experience. Unless knowledge is accompanied by the growth and expansion of the power of the individual, it is nothing. Well, that, as I say, is a metaphor uh, or a, a model from a particular tradition, the Pythagorean tradition, and I think it has many connections with the uh, view of the cosmos as expressed in the physical worldview, and uh, certainly I have found that it, it vibrates very strongly with the type of view that I have been led to um, by the study of embryological process. The hierarchy is uh, perhaps not explicitly unfolded there, um, but it is certainly a part of this tradition, and it's that kind of model that I feel is required in order to guide our imagination and the structure of our scientific activity in order to develop um, these hierarchical levels of perception. <coughs> Uh, uh, you, you want to start? Uh, but I you remember to give your name again. Yes, Friedrich Capra. I was struck by the similarity to modern physics when you say that biological structures can only be understood or have to be understood in terms of context because this is exactly what we experience in physics. It's very different from the traditional approach in physics which goes back to Democritus and which said if you want to understand a thing we have to take it apart and study the components. So. Uh, we, traditionally, we have always explained objects in terms of their components and have reduced the objects in the world to the chemical elements first, then the atoms of these elements to the nuclei and electrons, and then the nuclei to the protons and neutrons. But at the level of subatomic particles, we are faced with a situation where we can understand a particle only, as you say, in its context, that is, as an interconnection or a correlation between other particles. So that here also it is not the uh, constituent that determines the whole, uh, but rather the whole which determines the constituent. This has been emphasized very strongly by David Bohm in one of his recent papers. And uh, it has ex been expressed by uh, Henry Stapp, another physicist, more or less in the words that a particle is not an elementary, unanalyzable uh, entity, but in essence a set of relations that reach out towards other things. So this is uh, exactly uh, the same situation. I could also go on for, for another hour to talk about the vibrations. I have, I have a special chapter in my book on this, and especially about the fact that each vibration contains all other vibrations, which we call the bootstrap philosophy in physics, but I don't want to go into no, it it's too long. Uh, I think that um, there may be some difference between the, this biological concept of context and that of physics, in that you can take, say, a protein molecule, an enzyme, out of a cell and have it in a test tube, it exists as, it, you know, as such, independently of the physical context of the cell, but to understand its functioning you must understand the, 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 its relations to the other parts of the cell. Whereas it seems that with um, subatomic particles, there are, you, can't, you actually can't take them as individual particles out of a nucleus, mm. say. They can be transformed. They have to, to understand their very nature as a particle. You must think of them in the context of the whole nucleus. So I think there is possibly a difference here 
at least to a superficial level. Well, of course, there's, there's a difference in the level. The dimensions are different, and, and therefore the, the, the extent of approximation you can make is, is probably different. But you can think of enzymes or proteins as little, little mechanisms. Well, perhaps but I could say something to this. You see that uh, if you go back into the <coughs> history of physics, uh, you could say the atom could be thought of at a certain level as uh, quite independent and analyzed chemically. But then when we go into the deeper constitution of the atom, we find that the particles that make it up cannot be thought of that way. Now, it may well turn out that the biologist is rather at the phase where the physicist was a few centuries ago, or a century ago, that he is dealing with something like the atom, which has a, a relative existence. But if he gets into something deeper, into the deeper nature of life, he may also come to things more like uh, Brian Goodwin is talking about, where uh, uh, something is happening which cannot be analyzed in that way. Yes, well, all I'm saying is that at this level at, uh, at which Brian was talking, um, one hasn't got to that stage yet. One is still at a level where one can think of an enzyme perfectly well in mechanical terms. Um, but maybe that at some stage one will have to go to a deeper level where that is not an adequate way of thinking about it. Could I ask Brian Goodwin whether you think that uh, in your work that you are beginning to point at such a deeper stage? Well, there are two ways to go. Um, one is to study the context within which the molecules are acting, and that is, um, that's the main thrust of our, our work at the moment. The other way to go um, is to look at the behavior of the enzyme itself, and I think when one goes within the structure of the macromolecule, it will very quickly become necessary to um, analyze things in terms of fields rather than in terms of mechanisms. And therefore, once again, it will be necessary to develop a more holistic attitude. Now, um, it will still probably be possible to develop a perfectly adequate explanation of enzyme action when the enzymes are studied in the test tube as purified entities outside of the organism. Um, so that one is creating, you see, one is then creating a separate system within which there will be levels of organization. Yes. Could you what you mean by mechanism as you used it there, as opposed to field. I, I, I think I know what it, mm. from what David Bohm has written in physics, but in biology, uh, how would you distinguish between mechanism and the operation of fields? Yes, I tend mm -hmm. to use it in a somewhat idiosyncratic sense, I think. Um, mechanism I see as something with entirely local action. You can see what acts on what. <coughs> Uh, in the sense that the, the Cartesian um, theory of the gravitational field would be that there is something which exists with hooks or eyes or something which pulls between two bodies. That, I would see, as a where you can actually identify the components within the system. Um, a field is something which operates over a space, um, and in a biological system, the field is usually interpreted to be some distribution of molecular species, graded distribution in space, and therefore it has a direct physical interpretation. Um, but it's accompanied by the passage of electrical fields and, and so on. In other words, there are electrical elements uh, in the field. But they still have their effect. The field itself influences the local mechanism, if you like, or the local activity. Perhaps I shouldn't, perhaps I shouldn't use the language of, of field and mechanism in, in that way. I should simply refer to local processes and global processes. That would perhaps be a much more consistent way of talking about things. Because I don't want to make any sharp qualitative distinction between the activities that go on within these different domains. Yes, yes. Uh, Zorsky. Uh, you talked, Brian, about uh, model building. And I think it's something that uh, we have to be aware of, that we do have a tendency, in fact, maybe that's the way we work, in building models or images of, uh, of what it is that we're trying to explain or understand. And the confusion can arise, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, between taking the model too seriously and so then you don't quite know what you're looking at. Are you looking at the model, 
or are you looking at the thing in itself, for lack of a better word? So we have to... Uh, I think that we'll have to look at the model building process in order to come to a greater understanding of you know, ourselves in this process. Yeah, I think this connects with, with the individual as, as a, a creative agent. In a sense, our models, we tend to regard them as somewhat abstract, but in fact they are real, they're real forces, and they shape our being. When we make a model, we actually, as you say, our being is affected by it, and so is the environment. It's not something that just exists within our heads. Um, and therefore the model is a very active thing, and I, I think you're absolutely right that, that we must be well aware of what models we're constructing. Um, and we must try to find that model, that creative activity, which is appropriate to any given situation. Yeah. So um, I don't know whether this is the appropriate time to make this comment, but I'll make it anyway. It seems to me that um, uh, even asking questions about uh, constituents, mechanisms, processes, etc., is itself both a creative as well as an artificial activity. All causes are inventions. All processes are inventions. What we, um, if you think of saying, why does this happen? This too is dependent upon a particular model. Mm -hmm. And uh, if one talks about one's own awareness, you mentioned about seeing. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of the initiation into seeing, what part of being a rishi, a seer, is in fact breaking of the urgency to look for causes and mechanisms mm -hmm. of comprehending things without analyzing it and uh, viewing it as a dynamical process. In this process, of course, one arrives at new entities and these new entities then become objects in terms of which one builds new models. Mm -hmm. So that the hierarchy of seeing, of being initiated into higher and higher steps, is in fact a sense of freedom from uh, crystallize uh, from uh, um, uh, constraints that uh, you break out of a particular mode mm -hmm. and you function in a certain fashion, you see new things, you comprehend new entities, but then these entities become uh, building blocks for a next stage of operation mm -hmm. and again you have to move. So even the question of um, asking for causes, even in a global sense, or even asking for levels, itself seems to me a limitation. Mm -hmm. It may be a necessary limitation. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if I were to say that you must not have levels, that too is a limitation. Mm -hmm. That it seems to me like a person who wears different um, items of clothing at different times or lives in different countries or different places at different times. It seems to be necessary to move freely between one version and the other version. Mm -hmm. um, that while it seems to be possible to see without seeing into parts. At other times you have to see, the same person has to see into individual components. Mm -hmm. In talking about society, I mean, I hope to uh, make these remarks again and again, if I'm permitted. Um, in talking about society, I mean, uh, we did talk about whether we should have outrage or whether we should have concern and so on. We talk about poverty and we talk about um, misery and violence. There are always cases in which you have I mean, that is one mode of perception. There is another mode of perception in which you see even you are acting in the, within the thing as part of society that you have. So it seems to me that um, uh, even the choice of specifying that this is in terms of constituents and, pro, um, and um, local effects and something else in terms of global phenomena and um, in terms of teleonomy rather than in terms of immediate chemical reactions seems to me two different modes of looking at the same thing. And one sees the correct perspective only when you see both of them at exactly the same time. Earlier um, in um, Dr. Globus's um, discussion, he had talked about the fact that uh, wherever you go, people seem to be quite convinced that they are amongst the best in the world. In a certain sense, in um, everyday phenomenon of seeing, you see this effect in perspective. I mean, everything that you see immediately near you appears to be brighter, more detailed, uh, larger than things which are at a distance. And we view them both in the manner in which you see them and in the manner in which they ought to be seen if you went there. And then you 
from this one you get the notion of perspective and, and distance. So in the same sense it seems to me that these two levels of analysis of the same sequence of phenomena are necessary to be able to see things in perspective, in depth, that it is both the sequence of uh, local phenomena as well as the global description that alone seems to have any comprehension. Right. Do you want to reply to that? No, I, I agree with them. Uh, this is almost the same problem that uh, Professor Wilkins brought up earlier with regard to the art artificiality of uh, whatever it is that we're doing, and perhaps the better word for all of this is construction, that we have to construct things one way or another, and as you suggest, that we move flexibly between constructions. But constructions aren't artificial. They're biologically given. We, we, that's the way the apparatus works. We have to construct in order to do anything. But the various constructions, uh, none of them I would consider artificial, and yet they all are partial, and therefore, if you want to call them artificial, they have that tone to them. But I don't know if artificial is quite the right word for it. Yeah. Artifacts, they say that they're made, uh, in a way, they're mental artifacts. They're artifacts, that's fine, but artificial in the sense It has a wrong connotation. It has, a it has a, so this condemnatory con so that's connotation. What I was objecting to, yeah. in other words, I agreed that it, they were artificial, and yet I couldn't go along with the idea that they were uh, not true or not yes. real art. Because they are fitting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you see. I just They're taking up this point. No, it's not. Um, yeah. you, you, there are artifacts in the sense that we have to actually, the process of discovering what they are is construction. Right. But it, that doesn't mean that they're artificial in the other sense. And that, um, I mean, if per impossible we were made in a different way and we could zip open our heads and see it, then we wouldn't have to construct in the sense of making an artifact. We can't do that, so we've got to, we've got to, as it were, arrive well, at the... Even if we zipped open our heads, <coughs> and we're doing that with electrical mm -hmm. recordings, in a sense, uh, we still have to interpret what we... Somebody no, has say, to look at it. No, but let's say if we zipped open our heads, and what we found was um, a piece of paper with a circuit diagram, like the back of a radio. Um, That's a construction, too. Yes, but I know. We arrive at what's on the paper using inductive inference, but if, per, if God gave us that paper of everywhere, then we wouldn't have to construct, we'd have it. God is a construction too. <laughs> 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 You're just replacing one construction by the other. Yes, I, yes right. but I thought that what Pribram was meaning is that the, uh, the process that we have to undergo in arriving at, cons at models involves constructing in this way, and that's perfectly true. But that um, it's, not it's not logically necessary that we, had a, that we arrive at them in that way. I mean, they could come to us in a flash, or God could give them to us. In which case, we wouldn't have to construct them in your way. Is, is that, I mean, do you agree, or is that your it's, meaning? It's, it's hard for me. The implicate mode, using uh, David Bohm's terminology, isn't, doesn't have any constructions in it, as it were, until something happens in the explicate mode, and it, you know, here I'm, I'm not talking science or, or fact, I'm just sort of speculating or guessing. I have a feeling that we'd be terribly confused if there were nothing but the implicate mode. But the moment you get into the explicate, you're already dealing with some kind of construction. And uh, that's all we can talk about communicate, and so on, that the implicate mode is so confusing and, and meh, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it, you're just there. And the moment you talk about a circuit diagram or anything like that, you're already talking about one particular explication of that implicate mode. Um, speak, uh, stepping back into my role as the Indian traditionalist, um, when we are taught um, literature, we are taught something which vaguely translated might be called pun, but it is something much more serious than that. It's a, it's a figure of speech. And um, a good poem very often has a pun in it. And the pun, the purpose of the pun is at the first stage, of course, to hide meaning from somebody, like sort of a spy message. I mean, instead of writing it in secret ink, I mean, you write it in such a fashion that it means something. Second, uh, sort of a technical virtuosity in which you convey two meanings by the same set of words. 
And at the higher reaches of the thing, you convey the same meanings, not by a, a pun of the sound of the word, but rather even if you replace the words by equivalent words from the dictionary, you would still have it. It is in the constellation of ideas that you have the pun. Um, one of these examples is a mnemonic for grammar, which is used in my language, which says that there are seven cases and there are seven declensions, case endings corresponding to this one. And these are such, such, such and such. And it says that then the beginning of each of these declensions are such and such. Then it says that the, but this, of these seven, the very first is the one without any declension at all. And it's a very useful thing because if you have to remember seven cases and seven declensions, I mean, you really have to have either a piece of paper on which you write it or uh, some mnemonic device by this one. But um, it is only several years later that I realized that this same statement could be interpreted as a philosophic document. That uh, it basically says that there are, in fact, many levels in which the nominative case, nominative singular functions, namely in relation to something. And there are a number of these relations. And each of these is a declension, each of these is a modification. But on the other hand, the only unmodified one is, in fact, the very important, the primary, the most important one, which is in relation to no defined relation, therefore no deformation of the system. I mentioned this not for the philosophic content, but the idea that uh, these two ideas could be conveyed by the same set of sounds seems to me to be very remarkable. And when you look deeper into the thing, it is not an accident that these things have come, that in fact language itself developed in to express the relation of a person with regard to other things. If at this stage of when you see these two things together, you see in fact something totally new, which was neither philosophical nor uh, grammatical, but something which connects on to the origins of language and its relationship with other things. You see a perspective, you see something in depth. The same thing happens with regard to seeing through two eyes. I mean, with each eye you see approximately the same thing, but things are flat. But with two eyes you see the two visions combined together, you begin to see depth, which is something that was not there in the earlier stage. Similarly, by seeing both the global and the, and the um, in the small description, the stage by stage and the global description, one begins to see something else which is not describable in terms of one or the other one. So I would e neither want to put one above the other one, nor to talk of one as natural and the other one as artificial. But in fact, any experience requires both immediate comprehension as well as analysis, because in this process of analysis, and identifying it with the immediately perceived thing, you have an entirely new creative perception of what you had before. So I hope that uh, neither biology nor physics would ever come to the point where, in a sense, you have only a holistic description without having the possibility of seeing step-by-step -step things. Mm -hmm. You want to say something, Harsh? Yes, I, I want to uh, Harsh Tankhar. I want to return to the question of transformation. I think, Dr. Goodwin, Goodwin, you were saying that the process of transformation was hierarchical, that it involved uh, higher and higher orders of cognition. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there's an endless series of uh, initiations that we must undergo. I think in the Eastern, the Hindu tradition, there is a similar idea of uh, birth and rebirth. And yet, all mystical experiences and all uh, that one hears talk about some kind of final point at which uh, this hierarchy disappears and uh, you are free of continual initiations into further transformations. And I was wondering whether this is the kind of transformation that we are talking about just now. Or, we are talking, or is it this hierarchy that we are talking about? Yes, well, um, without any evidence except that from ancient writing I, or the occult sources, I would certainly tend to um, the view that there's a finite number. There are maybe six initiations um, in total, I don't know. Um, but that ultimately you get back to the null point, you get to the point where Dr. Sudarshan was talking about now, where there is no, no declension, there is just pure being, 
or whatever word you want to use. And when you've reached that state of t total freedom, then um, I have no idea what happens next. I doubt that you're incarnate anymore. I would like to also say the same, same thing with regard to Dr. Sudarshan and Arsha said. Is perception gradual, hierarchical, and each perception a, a step in initiation, higher up, higher up, higher up? And who is to teach the higher levels? And therefore, who is, becomes the authority? You follow, sir? Mm. Or is there only perception, direct perception? And from that perception, the cause, all the rest follow, not the other way around. Mm. I'm just. I would like to say something with some trepidation to talk with you about this matter in public. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have expressed at uh, various times um, over the years the point of view that um, searching for, a, for an initiator, searching for a, a higher mode functioning entity a power mains into which you can plug yourself in is an is somewhat of a fruitless activity. It is a traditional activity, but it's a fruitless. I submit um, that one could view this as a. I'm a theorist in science, but um, in terms of other activities, I would like to function as an experiment. One could submit it to an experimental situation. That if you find that in a certain condition, in the in the company of a certain person, in relation to a certain person you become magnified, you become more efficient, you become more uh, artful, as um, Dr. Capra mentioned. Then it seems to me that particular person's company, person's um, influence, is something that you cultivate. Not as a, as a surrogate, but only as a device that instead of sitting quietly in your room, you say that, now let me go and spend the time with Krishnaji. If, I, if he would let me be in his presence, then I am likely to think oh. about certain things and I would function in a certain fashion. If I am in this um, surroundings, I am not likely to think about um, the competitive dog-eat world of uh, modern science. Then I, I should cultivate this one. But if I can think deep thoughts only in the surroundings, then I am restricting myself. The question of perception uh, or seeing, I prefer the word seeing because perception seems yeah. to be yeah. too scientific. Uh, the question of seeing is always one which, in my estimate, seems to be a double activity. One, you see. And when you see, you don't say, I am seeing. I am now going to see. I open my eyes and I am going to focus it in this direction. I see. But then I say, I have seen. And at that particular moment, I analyze how... How was it that I was able to perceive that there was a sequoia tree out there? In this case, I didn't. Somebody told me. Uh, and when I asked this question, I might say, well, the reason I thought about this particular thing or I saw this thing was because of the fact that there was nothing else to do here or that there was uh, the appropriate ambience for this one. Or I might say, this was because of the fact that this is the place where Krishnaji is living at the present time. In the same sense that it seems to me initiation to seeing is a process description of the seeing itself. The seeing is the immediate, absolute, primary, more elementary reality than how, why I see, how I saw, what was the circumstances. And in the moment of seeing, there is no question of who made me see. In fact, there is no question of made me see. There is only see. There is only see. It is very often done, however, that uh, with a certain amount of humility and certain amount of practical wisdom, that you identify that there was, when you ask, why did I see, that you point to a particular cause. And very often it happens that that particular uh, agent seems to be more than temperature or um, visual surrounding, a particular person. His presence, his memory, his influence, his touch, his sound, his uh, form, his appearance, even his photograph or um, uh, mention of that name. and. Uh, such a person is not a static person because the person grows. I may see a friend of mine today and I might simply treat him as a friend. 
But five years later, I might remember something that he said today and then say, oh, what he said was in fact deep wisdom which was given in great love to me because he knew. He may not have known anything about it. But to me, then he is a teacher and initiate. So it's, I would take the more practical point of view and then say that if I find that company of a certain person, association, a, a declension in relation to a certain person is a more if efficient, more artful method of doing the thing, I would have no hesitation to identify that person as the seer who has initiated me into seeing. And then I retain the right at every time to say that, well, what I saw was not what it was, it was an illusion, that in fact that person happened to be a, an initiator at that time, but it was something that I attributed to him. But that seems to be true even in a more mundane affairs with regard to a doctoral uh, guide, a person who initiates into your, into your research. It seems to me that um, when I was initiated into fundamental research, I gave much credit to my teacher. I still feel very respectful towards him, but it seems to me this was a very stylized form of appreciation to a, a function rather than a, a phenomenon that happened at one time rather than to the person. Uh, can I ask you, it's interesting what you just said, I find it fascinating, but could I ask, must this initiator be a person? I mean, could it not logically be a pill or, a, you know, a ray of particles floating down slowly, hitting your person, etc.? Some perception of nature. Yes. Uh, I could give you two answers. One is the traditional answer of India, which says that, yes, that person has to be real, alive, and uh, functioning as a human being as long as you are functioning as a human. Um, in practice, even in tradition, there are examples. I mean, the, the great seer, the, the patron saint or the patron seer of all scientists, I mean, Vishwamitra, who was a king who found that at a certain point his, all his um, arms might was incapable of uh, uh, overcoming a poor old rishi who was um, living in a forest. I decided that this was no longer efficient. He abandoned it and then went about acquiring his powers. And many, many times he was in trouble. But eventually he found the things by himself. So there are cases of people who have seen things by themselves. But um, the traditional answer seems to be, and many, many people, Prashnaji, I am sure, uh, counts himself out of uh, this um, traditional statement. Uh, many, many people who, whom I respect for obvious reasons, seem to say that, yes, it must be a person who is in human form as long as you are able to function only in human form. I don't know why it is, but um, it seems to work every now and then. Yes, it seems to work, but then someone else might say, as David said, nature has done it for me, or some more perverted character might say, this pill has done it for me. Now, just because a certain set of persons that you happen to respect very much says it must be a person, I mean, one tends to want to ask, why must it be a person? No, I, it, it seems to me that if that first, if at a particular time you find that a pill is doing, pill or um, say grass, is able to do it better than the person, and you really have qualitatively new experiences, totally new experiences, which to your own mind appears authentic, it seems to me I would then change my mind and then say that it is so. So what I'm saying is that this is a matter not to be settled by argument, but by direct mm -hmm. empirical observation. But would you say that Seeing is, you depend on somebody, either a pill, tranquilizer, nature, or a person? No, it is simply that you see more sometimes I, with the aid of something. I'm, I just like to find out if you do see with the aid of somebody, or it must be something totally new, the perception independent of everything, independent of persons, tranquilizers, nature, pill, or drug. Uh, when you see you do not have a, any other person assisting you, in fact, when you see you do not even have a when, you see. Now you ask the question, I want to put it into the matrix of the space-time causal matrix, okay. and then I ask, what is, why is it that I saw but I do not see now? And uh, then I have to answer, like the blind beggar in, um, uh, who met Jesus. He was asked, how did uh, 
you how did this man jesus make you see and after many explanations finally in exasperation he says i do not know all i know is that i was born blind i was uh, blind from my birth and this man said put this mud on your eyes and go and wash in the uh, lake of shiloha and once you, i washed and i now see in the same sense one can say if i look for a cause i can say in this particular case this series of seeings were directly initiated by this particular person now i may change my mind later on and then say no 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 he had really nothing to do with it right. what happened was that i got rest i ate vegetarian food i had uh, no newspaper or telephone or television and therefore in this particular context with the smell of incense that was the thing which was initiated and i think maybe one could use an, another me- metaphor also which is used in, in the east that uh, it's like cleansing a mirror and it is your own mirror but the person just helps you to cleanse it and once it is clean mm. then you see just naturally and nothing interferes with it it's, it's just your own seeing that is true in a certain sense but at this point it seems to me it almost borders on the semantic because the the devotee of the great master who says that i am nothing but all i see is because of my master and the person who says that look i had a mirror or i had a scope and it was sort of dirty and somebody cleaned it up it seems to me it doesn't make any difference because you say that you are not seeing with your things so it it seems to me very slight shade of difference i said as a zen saying you know that it was a monk who said there's no mirror and no dust you say who revolutionized the whole thing mm-hmm. uh, and i said there have been different points of view uh, so that we don't know uh, see can can we actually give an, uh, any explanation of why why we see and, and i think the point raised by krishna murti should be reconsidered that is there anything more fundamental than seeing that is at all possible <laughs> so would you say that what you see now can be seen better next year no sometimes it is quite the other way around there are, there are times when you are very clear about what it is no, all about no, uh, if you see something which is true hmm? can you see something that what you saw is being true as being false next year yes then it's not see when you see you see when you ask what did i see before when you analyze the thing then it there is no possibility of seeing what i see now later on because when there is a later on then obviously it is not one seeing but seeing together that's, with certain that's conditions that's my yes. point that's my point but in terms of uh, here i am at a slight disadvantage because i am not trained in um, psychological or uh, physiological psychology it seems to me that either under um, spiritual uh, i mean, use the word spiritual i don't really know what to, i mean non drug induced <laughs> yes. um, altered states of consciousness and uh, mild drug induced all states of consciousness both seem to have some common features in the sense that they both have a faint sense of causality of time but it is an altered time sequence and in that altered time sequence the time before and the time now are really not two different times but really continuous quite right uh, though you are aware in a certain sense by looking at your diary for example that the, there were seven months in between these two you know that but still the other time that goes on is in a sense the same vision in which you see more and more clearly just like when you look at a person and you distinguish features and then you suddenly see your friend and there is a sequence in that thing but yet there is no sequence because you there was a time when you did not see and then a time when you see no but when you see something as being true or as being false can that be changed in a few years or a few days later the the, the recollection can be changed but what you see later on is not even conditioned by what you have saw, seen before i don't agree no, i don't i don't agree no. I, I, i i think that chronological time has reached 5 minutes to 1 and if we could just finish in about a minute or two i mean it seems to me that whatever one sees um is always taking place within a context um and that even if it's true that given a certain context 
what we see must be true, and I would probably want to question that. But even if it's true given one sort of certain context, surely it's possible to see the same kind of insight using in the sense that we're talking about it, in a, different set, in a different context, which would render the first insight in its context false. So that I think, um, even insights in this very profound way, I, I think you gave away too much. I mean, I think one could say, justifiably, that uh, an insight could be rendered false at time t plus one. Why not? No, no, all I was simply saying was that you don't... I, at the moment of seeing, you don't now ask the question, now how does now that I see these things, is it really true, that what I saw before? No, sir. Uh. I don't mean quite that. May I just finish? Just one there. <laughs> <laughs> May I have I one? Have I saw something true. That religious organizations were not beneficial. I was the head of something religious, you know all about that. I resolved, I said, resolved. I don't go back and say, oh, how terrible, why wish I hadn't resolved, dissolved it. Because that is the fact, that is the truth, that is, it, there is no other argument against it for me. So I said, that's finished. I never regretted it, I never went back to it, I never joined other groups or anything. That's so. So is perceiving variable? Is seeing dependent on environment, drug, gurus, if all that? Or is it something totally new that you see and that's the end of it? That, uh, the latter one. Yeah. You see and that is the end of it. Yeah, that's all. I don't even ask the question, is this going to remain no, 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 no. Come on, come on. We, we start again at the three, quarter, half past three, is that right? Yes.